Good morning, evening, afternoon, or night, whenever you're watching this. This is Event Horizon number X. We're not too sure what number it's going to be, but event essentially it's our first fully online Event Horizon. Uh, I'm the usual MC, Russell Jones, so tonight, uh, or again, whenever we are, I'm going to be um, starting us off with some poems of my own and uh, a little prose of my own too. If you've been to an Event Horizon, you know what to expect, but if you haven't, Event Horizon is a, a regular science fiction cabaret night, which brings together poetry, prose, music, and other performances, all under the umbrella of science fiction. And it usually runs in Edinburgh, but today we're running in your living room uh, and in my apocalyptic bunker where I store all my games. So um, if you have been before, you'll know that when I introduce somebody, I also tell a joke. So uh, here's the joke. Why did Seven of Nine throw up when she went to the toilet? Anyone? Uh, she found the captain's log. Yes, that's the tome we're going for today. Um, so I'm Russell Jones, as I said. I am the poetry editor and deputy editor of Scotland's best and only science fiction magazine, Shoreline of Infinity. And I also run the events for Shoreline of Infinity, as well as being just a writer and an editor generally of sci-fi and fantasy usually. So I'm going to start off with a poem from uh, my collection, Dark Matters, which is a book of sci-fi poems uh, published by Tap Saltiri, a great little independent Scottish press, which I encourage you to go check out. And this first poem was turned into a comic by Edward Ross. I'm hoping that we can actually show you that comic whilst I read it. And it's called Whatever Happened to the Blue Whale in 2302 AD. The hornets are livid this spring. We lock the windows, pull the blinds to shut out the din of stingers beating against the glass. Another wave's coming. The news reminds us to keep as cool as we can, because the next flare will cut the electricity. We crank the aircon to maximum, drop a tab of alkaline to settle the drinking water. Grandpa rocks in the corner telling us about the eons he sailed the burning seas, how good men lost their sight for us. Such a shame, he repeats. There's no marine to trawl, no beach to hold our castles, the reservoirs of scotch broth consistency. We've stopped asking how the old world was or why he wouldn't stop casting weighted nets, burning doll's heads, or signing grey air agreements. We grimace at how he lives in those dead days, won't let go of heather and hummingbirds and marmosets. He calls himself Maka, Captain Ahab, Pinocchio, shakes a crystal ball which holds a long gone city, ash flecks spiraling, settling on the tall tin roofs. And my next poem is from my new collection, which is called Cocoon. It's a full poetry collection about transformations. Uh, unfortunately, it looks like the launch for that may not be happening, at least in kind of live um, with people having to keep away from each other. So uh, we may do some online stuff for that too. And Cocoon is a full collection and that's also published by Tap Saltiri. Please uh, pre-order if you're interested. Um, yeah, so this next poem, um, is also going to be a comic in Cocoon. There are five comics in Cocoon. Um, and this one will be illustrated by Caroline Greville. It's also being turned into a short film uh, of the same name as the poem. Uh, maybe we can put a link in there. Uh, but if not, then search for an official guide to surviving the invasion. And you can watch the trailer for the film of the poem. Anyway, this is the poem. An official guide to surviving the invasion. They're hurt as we are by misery. Close the cupboard doors, lock the children inside. Don't open the tinned peaches for a fortnight. Reduce the hours you sleep. Insomnia is bleak. Avoid friends and family, games, TV. Blow out all the candles. Under no circumstances should you sing. 
they may appear human. Don't panic, stay vigilant. Your morale is vital to international security. If consumed, if you hear their caterwaul, scream your failures and insecurities. Wait for our signal. Let the two minutes siren light a fire quick before they find you and burn everything you keep dear. Again, you can check out the movie for that. Um, it's called An Official Guide to Surviving the Evasion. And uh, the book coming out is called Cocoon. Uh, so that's a couple of poems. I thought I'd read a little bit of my prose since I also write prose and known to some. Um, this first one is just a sample from a short story which I wrote in this book here called Scotland in Space. And what happened was three writers, uh, one of whom was me, met up with uh, three scientists, three social scientists and uh, three artists. And we all talked about the science that the scientist was involved with. And then the writers went away um, and created a story sort of based on that and the idea of what might the space industry look like in Scotland in the future. Thus, Scotland in space. Again, this is actually published by Shoreline Infinity in conjunction with various places such as um, the University of Edinburgh and the Edinburgh Futures Institute and the School of Physics and Astronomy, uh, as well as ESTOS, the Social Dimensions of Outer Space Group, which um, tries to meet in Edinburgh and is interested in the social dimensions of outer space. So I'm gonna read um, some of this story, probably just uh, two or three pages. Uh, as you can see, again, we might be able to show this on, with using the technology, you might be able to see the story, but uh, if not, you can order a copy and read it for yourself. But you can see it's kind of experimental. Um, in terms of its layout and so on, which all plays into some of the ideas into this. It's a, it's a love story set across the great expanse of space. Anyway, I'll read two or three pages and we'll move on. So the first section is called, We Reminisce Through Photographs, and the story is called Far. We Reminisce Through Photographs. I remember it like it was tomorrow. We met six degrees north of midnight, the Royal Observatory, Edinburgh, your eye was on the chronoscope I'd waited months to use. We can share, you said. You were much too brilliant to argue with. I knew I'd lose myself in your eyes, your pupils like black holes. A laugh like glass, like kittens in boxes, like light stretched across a great expanse. I wouldn't call it love at first sight because I think you were cautious at first, maybe even irritated, but it was enough. We discussed your work. Sorry, we discussed our work. You pretended to be impressed with me. I really was impressed with you. You were too smart, too suave, nerd, too good looking and socially acceptable for someone like me, I thought. Then we drank at the world's end. So you're the other chronotopographer in Scotland. I thought we'd never meet, you half joke. Soon your hand touches mine. We pretend it's an accident. My round, shots. You'll make me forget myself, but I nod. You're impressively quick, nauseatingly generous. We drink and drink and drink each other in. The last shot took my breath and I must have turned pale. Close your eyes, breathe, I heard you say, just breathe. I obeyed. I was quiet then, rarely went out except to work because I didn't have much to go out for. You started slowly, movies, meals at home, quiet restaurants, then games nights with your close friends, camping just outside the city borders when the heat and the smog were safe. Eventually, we flew to Paris and Madrid. By the end of it, I probably wouldn't have recognized myself. And it feels like the years have passed without us noticing. We map time like we map our lives, a sequence of bubbles and lines we could comprehend, hanging them around the flat like artwork. I'll leave it at that for now. 
Uh, I also wanted to read a, a little bit of prose from uh, another a novel that I've written, um, but unfortunately haven't. Bit of a technical error there, sorry. Um, yeah, so I'm going to read a short extract from a novel that I've written uh, that I haven't sold to a publisher yet. Uh, here's hoping. Uh, it's very fitting for our time. It's a novel in which uh, everybody dies on their 40th birthday and um, follows a psychiatric uh, doctor in a ward which looks after people who are in their final year before they die. So the novel's called Expiration Date and it, tracks uh, it's kind of structured as a, a month monthly countdown to the protagonist's final year as well in which he wants to find love before she dies january this is my ward this is my duty nobody will die today welcome dr babel the recon bleats emitting its emerald glow of my fingerprint the map of me a white sheet of light opens across my ward. Your glucose is low. Take one constitution tab. The recon dispenses my tab and I obey. And I grip my trolley and trundle along the central walk for the first check of the day. Some clients groan. Some smile. Others stay cocooned in their blankets. Everyone knows not to make noise for the first ten minutes whilst we acclimatise to the day. I spend those quiet moments checking rosters and reports. Everything's ready. Everything is in its place. At the refreshments booth, Benj taps his finger on the percolator. He's one of my favourite clients. Old land with his daily mug of greenhouse coffee. He's athletic, easy on the irises, but there's a nervous wisdom lurking under the surface. I sometimes catch a weight, is it fear or anticipation, lingering in his eyes, though our, though our sessions together have been undramatic. Good morning, Benj, I whisper. Morning, Doc. He inserts his fingertip into the trolley's recon, and it dispenses his tabs. All well, as can be. He, rattle the tab he rattles the tabs in his palm like dice, then knocks them back with a glug of hot coffee. How many this week? I hesitate. Just one. Officially, I shouldn't say anything, but my clients talk. Secrets are rare here, and Trini hasn't kept hers. I glance into Trini's room. It's empty, but she's made her bed as usual. The sheet's militarily tight. I thought today was your day off. I couldn't find cover. I lie. He sips his coffee. Fancy a mug? Maybe later on, I should get on. Good luck, Benj says, running a hand through his grey flecked hair, and I walk away smiling. I've been smiling too much lately. It could seem unnatural and might make my clients mistrust me. But I'm concerned my nerves might show through my teeth, and I prefer my ward to stay positive. It's good for everybody. Other wards I've visited have felt like death's waiting room. A lot of new admissions don't like my 8 a.m. starts, but I've seen clients disintegrate under their own regimes. They stay in bed longer and lose interest in hobbies, slowly descending into the void. There's depression on all wards, of course. That's part of life. But I know for a fact that levels are comparatively low on my watch. I'm proud of that. Dr. Babel, Alice, Trini taps my shoulder. She smiles, but the smile falters. She seconds from tears. Come on, love. I lead Trini into the quiet space, a collection of bean bags and tissue boxes which the clients avoid. It's where with people come to work through their struggles or just cry, a sanctuary nobody wants to intrude on or visit. I pull a wad of tissues from a box, hand them to Trini and park close the door behind us. Thanks. She sniffs, her eyes red with lack of sleep. I make a quick note to check her tab prescription. How are you feeling? I fall into a bean bag, motion for her to sit, and she does. Okay. She blows her nose. I guess. 
Is there anything you want to talk about? Monday, she says. I stay silent. It's one of the best ways to get people to talk, not to lead them if it's not required. A dry root will seek water. Will you be there? Most clients ask me to be there. I'm glad I've made those kinds of connections. It fills me with like a professional pleasure and helps the process run smoothly. Of course, if you want, I'll be there. Yes, please. She looks at me and I stare back. I put my hand on hers and she grips my fingers. I don't want, she cries and lurches forwards, wrapping her arms around me, her tears soaking into the shoulder of my dark shirt. I've taken to wearing black shirts lately because the damp doesn't show so easily and I don't want the other clients to see who's been crying. I wish I could have done more. The session is short and perfectly routine considering the time she has remaining. Soon we're dry eyed and laughing. I contact the catering department and they agree to make Trini's favorite. Two bacon cheeseburgers, a strawberry milkshake, followed by tin peaches and cream like her mum used to make. I tell Trilly I'll call the pet department and we'll request a spaniel puppy like the one she loved as a kid. There'll be yellow roses. We've got audio too, and she'll be going to and she'll be going to think about the songs that she likes. Everything's ready, I reassure her. Things will go as smooth as peaches and cream. And that's it for me. Um, I hope you enjoy all the other performances tonight, and I hope we'll see you in the flesh soon. Goodbye.